Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, thank the organisers for inviting me uh, to give a presentation today. Um, interesting picture to start my presentation. I really want to start with a, a um, analogy here um, because here you can see some guy's car's broken down. Um, he's a pile of smoke, he's sitting there with his arms waving. Uh, but the issue here is you don't, if you, and relating to why it's broken down, why is it breaking down? Um, is it repairable? It, is it um, going to happen again? Or is it irreparable? And this is where the analogy lies, because if you don't understand where the engine works, then there isn't any point, uh, any point in time where you can actually say, this is why it's going wrong, and this is the uh, diagnosis, and this is basically what we're going to say is how you either repair it or it's irreparable. And that's where the analogy then crosses over to what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the, um, my talk in terms of um, developing tools to really understand how the engine in terms of the symbiosis, the Nidarian dinoflagellate symbiosis, and uh, to, uh, to respect in terms of the holobiont with microbes as well, really functions. And in previous sort of work, it's been touched upon and we're developing it, but we really don't still understand the level of complexity in terms of how the engine functions, in terms of where the symbiont is housed within the host, how it retains its position, how the actual productivity is then uh, extended through to calcification, reformation, uh, and the possibility of understanding tools to, for producing evidence that we can say that climate change actually affects this component of the engine, and this is why it's going wrong. We don't want to be accused here of arm waving and saying climate change, I mean, we, we, obviously we know that, climate change is deleterious to the reefs. We are saying that temperature is affecting it and ocean acidification has certainly got the potential to do that. But until we really understand the complexities of the engine, um, we just really need to reiterate that fact that, that uh, the evidence is going to upheld that. So I'll, that's where the analogy is really um, to do with. There's three processes in terms of the uh, regulation or, or the, the Nidarian dinoflagellate symbiosis. The onset, which is really a, a crosstalk in terms of host microbe immunity and cell surface recognition, and David uh, spoke about that earlier this morning. Um, and then, as Tracy just mentioned, the, there's certain processes which, during a breakdown, um, result in the disassociation and removal of the symbiont and uh, bleaching and mortality. But I'm really going to focus on regulation because this gets back to this engine idea. Um, and it's the translocation, it's the facilitation of that symbiosis. Once it's in place, once the microbe is in the host tissue, it's the it's facilitation of the symbiosis through translocation of products between each partner. Uh, from the host, you'll get nitrogen and host release factors, which will propagate that as well, phosphates, and inorganic carbon. Dominant species, as we all, well, many of us probably know, a dominant species in seawater of carbon that's available um, for uptake is um, bicarbonate, and then that's converted through enzymic reactions into CO2, which is then uh, used in photosynthesis to produce the other metabolites that are translocated back to the host in terms of organic acids, um, O2, glycerol, informal triglycerides, and lipids. So lipids, why are they important? Well, you may know that they're, they're a dominant form of energy store um, used for uh, in production of ATP. Important in nutrition, obviously health, uh, in terms of essential fatty acids. Uh, obviously a main component of membranes, in terms of polar membranes. Gene regulation, they can actually affect transcription factors and post-transcription. Uh, Key roles in cell signaling in terms of inhibition and um, promoting cell signaling, and some of those that may have relevance to the symbiosis is in, in immunity, inflammation, uh, cell proliferation and death, uh, and the transition between in, within the symbiotic relationship, uh, which may be from pathogenesis to mutualism, depending on how that production works, and, uh, and maybe a response in terms of to oxidative stress. So one of the uh, working models that I've been working with is, is Aptasia, a symbiotic sea anemone, and using a particular uh, tool called HPLC mass spectrometry, high-performance liquid uh, chromatography mass spectrometry, to be precise, of fatty acids. And I'm going to really talk about the fatty acid element of lipids for the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the talk. Um, as you can see here, we have two distinct lipid profiles um, within the aposymbiotic. So these are anemones that have had the symbionts removed, 
uh, and the symbiotic anemones, which still have the, obviously retain the symbiotes. And as you can see, there's two different profiles. The symbiotic anemones here have considerable uh, difference in the amount of products and also the, the, uh, what products are available compared to the aposymbiotic. So that gives us an indication that in terms of lipids, there may be um, quite a difference in terms of what's available in the translocation. Excuse me. But how do we track this lipogenesis? Uh, lipogenesis being the term used for the actual synthesis uh, and production of lipids and the rate that they're, they're formed. Well, lipidomics is really a study in terms of very comparable to uh, metabolomics and genomics in terms of it's the study of really how these processes work in terms of pathways, production, rates. Um, and this tool is really something that I've been working with uh, with the use of stable isotopes and incorporation of in, uh, stable isotopes within enriched media, both in anemones uh, and corals, working within incubation chambers so we can um, maintain the concentrations. So I'm just going to spend a couple of slides here really talking about the, the, the technical aspects of this. Um, so within uh, HPLC mass spectrometry, you're measuring the mass of a particular product, uh, and that mass will have a certain... Uh, peak in terms of the way it comes off a column. And that peak can be tracked in terms of a trace. With this particular example here, which is uh, a fatty acid, has 22 carbons uh, and six double hydrogen bonds. 22 carbons with all the black circles here, you might be familiar with these, two oxygen uh, atoms. So that's the structure. That structure is denoted by um, a composition of C12, the dominant form of carbon and a slight addition of C13, which is a naturally occurring isotope. But if we put an enrichment of that C13 isotope in terms of DIC, DIC again being that dominant form of carbon that's utilized by uh, photosynthetic marine organisms, um, we actually can change the mass profile. So, for example, if these black C12s are then replaced by C13s, what you actually get is... Um, what you actually get here is anything up to 22 carbons will be um, incorporating into that uh, particular um, lipid structure, and that changes it. Now, we can measure then the inclusion of that C13 in terms of a level incorporation over time. So the more, more lipids that are produced that have that more incorporation changes over time. And as you can see, in certain products, that can be a linear response. This gives us a... A, a method in terms of measuring the rate of synthesis in terms of metabolism, which is something new in terms of monitoring how the engine's working. Equally, we can also use this technique to break apart the products that we actually find, so those particular peaks that are different in terms of aposymbiotic and symbiotic. We can ascertain which particular product, and then by a process called collision-induced disassociation, we charge up those molecules and then break them apart. Um, just here, the standard mass of that particular uh, liquid I've been talking about is 327. If we charge it and then break it apart, we may uh, see a loss of a, a water molecule, which will take it down to three, uh, 309. So we see the profile change. If we break it up some further, we see the release of CO2, which uh, takes it down to a mass of 283. So this gives us a way of actually identifying particular structures and then ascertaining exactly which product is where in terms of those lipid profiles that I spoke about earlier. Um, as you can see, we go back to that comparison between APOs and SIMS, and we can then ascertain what those products are using these techniques. And once we've done that, we can then put them into a framework of known lipid pathways or synthesis pathways, and actually understand where those components fit within the pathway and how that is then can be um, transponded onto the actual productivity of the symbiosis. I'm not going to go into too much detail in terms of <clears throat> uh, what these mean in terms of their particular function. Uh, I'll come back to the, uh, a few examples in a minute. Um, but it just gives you an idea that based on known pathways, we can actually disseminate where those products are likely going to be generated uh, and what the end products are going to result in. So I just want to go through a few examples of how this actually corresponds to particular lipids that we can see and why they're being synthesized at the rates they are. Um, this particular one first, myristic acid, is um, <coughs> 14 carbons. As you can see here, the, this is the first one on the left. I do, I, actually, I'll just explain these graphs because they'll continue through the next few slides. Uh, the black here is actually uh, 
C13 enriched symbiotic anemones. The red is aposymbiotic anemones. The green is non-DIC, so normal um, uh, seawater, not in, unenriched. And then the blue circle here is actually pellets that were collected after the incubation that have been expelled. So this gives a, almost like a comparative relationship to where that DIC is being incorporated and by which, which partner. Because the DIC is actually, or the, the, the dinoflagellate pellet that's produced is, is actually in line with a lot of the data that you'll see here. Um, so that particular, getting back to the, the particular lipids, um, the myristic acid actually forms parts of my, um, biomembranes as incorporation in the synthesis of new membranes. So it might actually act as a good indicator in terms of cell division and growth. Um, it plateaus after a certain level of incorporation. This is going to be a feature you will see through the rest of the graphs in terms of, this is around about 40%. Um, so why is it only being incorporated at, for, the, why is the enrichment only at 40%? Um, and I'll come back to that, but in terms of pot uh, potential other sources. The first fatty acid in, in lipogenesis is palmitic acid. And you can see here that although there's a little peak, uh, a little bump in it, it's pretty much linear. So there's a linear incorporation in those primary fatty acids. Stearic acid is the next one down, plateaus off, um, and potentially is then being incorporated into another in terms of the lipogenesis chain. Oleic acid is the next one along has a potential source for antioxidants, so there may be some functional uh, significance there for the symbiosis. Um, and then the essential fatty acid. We, we need essential fatty acids. We can't uh, synthesize certain fatty acids which are important to our metabolism, and we have to go and eat plants that do produce them. Um, in this case, the microalgae or the dinoflagellate algae are, are potentially producing those, and that may be also important to nutrition and, and the well-being of the symbiosis. Um, as you can see, generally, the aposymbiotic anemones and the um, uh, non-enriched media are actually producing a very similar signal, which is the green and red. And then the alpha-gamma linoic is where the, the essential fatty acids get used by separate pathways and is, in, is divided. Um, and then these, these three final graphs basically look at some endpoints in the chain, which I'll come back to. Quite high productivity here, long-chain fatty acids and DHA, very important in terms of its um, role in cell and immunity and inflammation regulation. But some aren't. Some fatty acids aren't incorporating for some reason. They, or they don't necessarily show a high level of incorporation. Here the pellet has a certain amount and there is a, you know, a, a low level of incorporation. But other things like arachidonic acid which aren't produced in many higher plants, but have been shown to be in, in dinoflagellates, aren't being produced for some reason. Or the indication of that incorporation isn't um, immediately clear. So then let's take those graphs. And, and I don't want you to really try and so understand what each graph means here, but essentially what, it, what I'm trying to get to is that we can actually incorporate all the different synthesis of these metabolites into known pathways. And it gives us an indication uh, in terms of where the productivity, where the, each, each lipid is then has other carbons added to, and that's how it progresses down the chain, or, or hydrogen atoms. This is basically the pattern of, of the chain, um, but where we see some of the ones where, that have a low incorporation, they're actually intermediates. So this may indicate that those low incorporations are rapidly turning over, whereas the ones with higher incorporation are probably being built up for a particular function. Which leads me on to the point where certain pathways will be producing lipids which have potentially an anti-inflammatory role against other particular products which have a pro-inflammatory role. Now, I'm not saying at this moment, because I don't have the evidence to say that that's exactly the case, but certainly the indications of what the synthesis of these particular products uh, is showing certainly may have relevance to the symbiosis and its regulation. They were sort of uh, an N of five grouping. This is, you, with this technique, you can look at a specific um, individual at any one time and say that's what the lipid composition is and that's what the metabolism is. Metabolism is. And of course, that could be very important in terms of then looking at the effects of climate change and how that may, may affect the productivity of this particular individual or a colony. Um, again, high product uh, towards the end of that chain and low product in terms of a different chain towards the end. Um, See here. Um, so that's really where I want to go in terms of the, uh, the, the use of this technique in terms of 
the, uh, the synthesis of this and um, measuring the lipogenesis within a particular example. But it's actually a transferable technique because we can use it in corals and in culture of different dinoflagellates. And obviously then that opens up the ability to understand what's going on under different dynamics of coral symbiosis, which could be then important in terms of acclimation and giving us our tool to show the level of acclimation possibilities. Lastly, I'll come back to those plateauing effects. 40-50% is really the limit of incorporation that we were seeing. Now, so where's the other 50% coming in terms of the product? Is it storage product? Is it coming from respiration in terms of the incorporation in dinoflagellates? Or is it coming from an alternative supply uh, such as heterotrophy. Using Artemia, it's possible to actually grow the Artemia in an enriched media. And then that gives us a measure in terms of where we can track heterotrophic incorporation, because when we're using the same technique and tool, we're just using a, set, a different supply in terms of where the carbon's coming in, in terms of production of metabolites <coughs> or lipids. This is just to show you the, really that the arachidonic acid, which was very low in terms of the DIC incorporation, through heterotrophic incorporation or feeding uh, Artemia of the enriched media, they can actually show that they actually build that particular product up. And then we can feed our anemones and our corals with that and track that to, as I say, uh, follow on different pathways and in incorporation for tracking the lipogenesis. So just in conclusion, then, it's, it's, this is really a, a tool to show that we can track what's doing, what the engine is doing. And in terms of adding evidence to uh, the ch potential changes that we may be encompassing or the corals may be encompassing with climate change. It's a useful tool. It may be transferable to other marine organisms that utilize um, DIC. It enables the total, and, and, um, the total and the rate of lipid production to be ascertained uh, and provides an insight into those regulatory processes that may be um, enabling the symbiosis to be stable. I'd just like to thank again the, the ARC for inviting me to, uh, to come here and Sophia and Alicia are the part of the, my colleagues are, as part of the lab with, with Ove. Uh, Jeff Netty and Michael Thomas have been instrumental in driving or piloting the HBLC mass spec and the staff at several research stations which I was there. And just as a little anecdote, well, if we get an insight to how the engine works, we may be able to understand if the, if the, if the engine is repairable or... Uh, it, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much indeed.